Okay, today we're talking about the new Panasonic GH6. Now, there's a few disclosure notes to cover. First of all, this is a loaner camera from Panasonic. It also isn't final firmware. I have a later firmware than the original beta firmware, but it's still pre-production. So there's some things in here that are still gonna be updated, and we're gonna get to those probably first. I haven't had this camera for very long, so this isn't gonna be as thorough as a normal Gerald and Dunn video. In fact, it might not even be as organized as a normal Gerald and video, because I'm gonna be jumping all over the place because I haven't had time to even organize my thoughts, and I got a lot of them going on. I got sent this camera late on purpose because there was an issue with the way that this camera it has an issue with streaking when you have high contrast scenes with like really, really bright things and really, really dark things. There's like streaks in the dark things. I'm going to show you some of this. So we're going to talk about it. So because of that, Panasonic didn't want to send me the camera right away while they were working on a fix because they knew that I would find it right away. And then that would be the whole conversation. I'd make a video about that or, or we'd go back and forth emailing about that the whole time. So they wanted a chance to fix it first. They put a new firmware on this camera that has made it not as bad, but it's still there. I was able to find it and still sort of recreate it in certain situations. So I'll let you know about those, but I also wanna let you know that Panasonic said that they are still working on it. And so hopefully it'll be completely fixed by the time you get yours if you choose to buy it. And as usual, Panasonic didn't pay me any money to make this video. The, this camera goes back. They lent me these lenses as well, the 12 to 35 and the 35 to 100. All this stuff goes back to Panasonic. And if you're wondering why I would post a video when I don't have all my thoughts organized and everything, it's because YouTuber problems, I'm trying to hit that same embargo to get the views like everybody else. I'll be honest with you, that's that's the rush, right? And I think Panasonic has the embargo set to like 8 p.m. on a Monday or something, so it's not even a good time to upload a video, but you gotta get your video out with them. Anyway, so I'm just trying my best to give you as much information as I can in the short amount of time that I have it, because every time that I don't, I get a million tweets on Twitter and comments of when are you gonna review the GH6 or whatever the camera is, so. At least I'm covering a little bit of it now. But let's jump right into this sensor and we'll talk about the streak and we'll talk about dynamic range. This is a Micro Four Thirds camera. And so there's known limitations of Micro Four Thirds. And my main thing with looking into this camera was how, how have they been addressed? So when it comes to Panasonic, those issues, well, are autofocus because they tend to stick with their contrast-based DFD autofocus. But also with Micro Four Thirds, it's dynamic range. You know, you get much more noise and worse noise performance in low light situations, and also generally just worse dynamic range overall. So we got a brand new sensor in here. This is a 25.2 megapixel sensor, and it has a, a new function, which is quite similar to, I don't know if you guys followed Canon, the C300 Mark III and the C70, how they have that DGO, which is where it can, it basically reads out the sensor twice, one to get clean shadows and one to get nice, rich, saturated, you know, highlight areas and then merge them and then composite that into a better sort of final image. So this isn't a dual native ISO like some of the Panasonic ones. It's not 800 and 4000. It's you either turn on what they're calling dynamic range boost. It's either on or it's off. Now on the Canon ones, you actually can't turn it on or off, but you can here but it also gets disabled in certain situations like the Canon one. So for example, at 4K 120, which this camera can now shoot, you can't use dynamic range boost, similar to the experience with the Canon camera. So up to 4K 60, you can turn it on, but it still is doing a nice clean, like oversampled image. So all of the 4K images, whether it's 24P up to 120P are all sharp and similar, which is great. So you've got that way to composite the image, right? Up to 4K 60, you can do that. It changes the base ISO. So if you are shooting V-Log, and this has proper V-Log, not V-Log L, it's V-Log, so unlike the original GH5, and it's included, you don't have to pay for an upgrade. So that's all good. So you're shooting V-Log, right? You have a base ISO now of ISO 250 when dynamic range boost is off, and you can choose to turn it off at any point. That's ISO 250. If you put dynamic range boost on, the base ISO now jumps up to 2000. You can't go below it, and that's just where you operate but the image is much better when you have it on. So I would run it all the time, unless you were shooting 4K 120. What I've noticed is that the zebras also change. So if you set your zebras to show you sort of the clipping point, when dynamic range boost is off, it's 80%. That's the max zebras, which I think is the same as it was on the GH5. But if you put dynamic range boost on, now you can go up to 85%. That's a pretty good indicator of what kind of experience you're gonna get when it comes to, can I get more highlights? You know, if you're exposing middle gray perfectly, and you have dynamic range boost off. Uh, actually, I, I took some shots outside. I'll put them on the screen right now. This is kind of what it, I did in here, shooting out there with the dark curtains in the room, and then you could see outside. And you can see with dynamic range boost off, it clips at this point. Some of the sky is gone, building that thing. But if you turn dynamic range boost on, all of a sudden, boom. 
the sky just comes back. So basically there's more headroom for highlights. Now it's not quite as good as the full frame cameras, the Panasonic S series cameras. They can go another, you know, like 10% higher. You get like another, I don't know, full stop basically out of those ones. Now I busted out the Xilinx 21 and I checked the actual dynamic range. And this camera, I feel like I was getting worse on this camera when dynamic range boost was off compared to the previous ones. I feel like maybe it was the GH5S I'm thinking of. You got about 10 and a half stops, somewhere between like 10 to 10 and a half stops. Now when you put dynamic range boost on, you get like 11 and a half stops. So you do get like an extra stop, maybe a stop and a half on this particular camera, but at least a stop better than previous Panasonic Micro Four Thirds cameras. And it's significant on this one because I was only getting like 9.9 .9 with it off and then like 11.4 to 11.6 with it on. So on this camera, you really want to turn it on. But if you're coming from a GH5S with the dual native ISO, you're still going to get about another clean stop better than the GH5S, but still a stop worse than the Panasonic S series cameras. Hopefully that makes sense. I think that's the most important part of this camera. That's why I've been spending so much time on it. But don't think that there's a second native ISO in here. It doesn't matter. Once you're at ISO 2000, you can shoot 3200, 6400, 12800, and it's all sort of scaling up kind of linearly in both modes, whether it's on or off. It's just that the on tends to always look better. Here's an example of the 12800 with the dynamic range boost off and then turning it on. You can see that the noise is much better. When you are setting those zebras, I said like 80% when dynamic range boost is off and 85% when it's on, is that you'll find the zebras, I feel like this has been a known issue with Panasonic, uh, similar to the focus peaking issue, where when you're getting ready to shoot, you have more zebras and more focus peaking, and then when you press record, they get reduced. With focus peaking, it's a bit annoying, but it's not too bad, but with zebras, it's kind of, it's, it's a problem, because you're looking at the zebra to see one of my frame is clipping, and then you press record, and they kind of get retracted a little bit. So is, is it no longer clipping? Like, it's weird. Now regarding that streaking issue, which is the reason why Panasonic delayed sending me this camera, I found that it's only in extremely contrasted situations. It first showed up when I was actually testing the dynamic range. Had the Xyla 21 out, it's completely dark in my environment, except for the bright little chips on the test chart. And the brightest chip would actually put this sort of unwanted anamorphic flare almost across the frame, similar in pattern and size to the, the light source. But I noticed that when you kind of blurred those details, that it went away. So that made me think that there needed to be some structure to it. So I tested it with this light above me here with the grid on it. And interestingly enough, if you stopped down and boosted the image in ISO so that, so that now you, you have clear lines on the grid, you can see like really pronounced streaking across the frame. But if you kind of bloom out the light or blur it, the streaks kind of went away. So it seems like there has to be some structure to that high contrast and then it causes the streaks. I don't really know. I have been told though that they're working on it, but if you're somebody that likes to shoot in these extreme situations where you shoot at nighttime and you like to shoot lights and lamps, this camera may not be for you in its current state. So you're gonna wanna wait until there's an official firmware out that fixes that problem. But if you're somebody that likes to shoot daylight landscapes or you know just people in regular kind of scenes, daylight scenes, or even controlled environments like this, you're not really going to see a problem. But I still think, given that this is, you know, like a flagship Micro Four Thirds camera, that we shouldn't be working around that problem. That problem needs to be fixed. And I'm told that Panasonic is on it. So I'm not gonna make, I'm not making a video right now of like how to deal with the streaking. It's fix the streaking and then we'll move forward. But it is there, so be aware of it. If you need to get one of these right away for whatever reason, then you know keep that in consideration until they release a fix for it. Other than that, you operate the camera in a very similar way. So you still want to expose, I think, 42% middle gray for V-Log. And if you're using your V-Log LUTs that you've been used to for, well, this is again, full V-Log, not V-Log L. So if you have LUTs that you've been using on your S-series cameras that you like, then they work here. And the color accuracy is pretty darn similar. I did a shot here of me holding the chart and checked it on the vector scope and it looked good. Uh, so no complaints, everything's pretty much the same, just now you have this dynamic range boost, which gives you gives you better performance than you expect on Micro Four Thirds. And what I like about this camera that I was liking on the S-series cameras that I added here now is they have that luminance spot meter, which is like that little square that comes up that you can put somewhere. So when I was doing the chart test, I put it on the middle gray line and I can just go until it says zero stops, meaning like it's not over or under, it's completely neutral. So if you want to expose the middle gray, that luminance spot meter from the full frame cameras is now on the Micro Four Thirds camera, which is great. And regarding LUTs and applying color and that kind of thing, this one now takes, you can actually import your own cube file. So it still has the 
view assist for vlog, but now you can import your own LUTs in cube format to monitor rate on the screen, which is pretty awesome. And I think they can go up to 33 point cube files. So I'm really happy about that. Same thing as like what I would put on my Ninja for monitoring. Let me just look through my notes here and make sure I didn't skip anything. Still got waveform monitors, still got vector scope. There's nothing from the GH5 that's missing. It's only added things. And if there's something that, if you had a GH5 and then you had a full frame camera from Panasonic, all the full frame stuff that you're expecting is likely in here as well. It's basically everything that Panasonic's made up to this point is in this camera. It just happens to be micro four thirds. Uh, it also has uh, the same, you can still put the same audio shoe on top, only now you can do four channel audio. So another benefit there, but it uses the same XLR module. It's got that cord so you can use the, the port out here and turn it into time code. So you can use time code by using this adapter cable that comes in the box, which I think the GH5S had as well. It's got the manual focus controls that I don't, I, I, there's been too many cameras. I don't remember which Panasonic cameras had which, but I, I know on some of the full frame cameras, you had the ability to control the manual focus. You could set it to linear from non-linear. You could set the degrees of the focus throw. You can do all that control in here now, which is great. And then there's some changes to the body, but again, very similar to the S1H. So the screen is now one of those double screens and it also has the fan grill right here and then another one on this side, similar to the S1H. And it's still weather sealed despite that, just like the S1H. And we've got the type of screen where you can tilt it this way now, but also flip it out. So it's very similar to the S1H, just a slight bit different. The tilt part of it doesn't, you know, it doesn't tilt too far. So it's not as good as like one of those sort of full photo camera tilts, but it does give you a little bit when you're behind the camera, which is nice. And then we still have the articulating screen as well. And the clearance is all good from the input and output jacks, which is nice. As far as ports, we got what you'd expect from Panasonic. We got a full size HDMI and a USB-C. And the USB-C is now power delivery. I don't think the GH5 had that. So you can actively charge and power the camera while it's running and all, it's great. And then we've got a dedicated port and flap for headphone and one as well for microphone up top here. And the microphone one is high enough that it you know, it doesn't interfere with the flip screen, which is great. Now there are some changes though, which include more record buttons. So we've got a red record button on the top here, and we've also got a red record button down here, and there's tally lamps on the front and the back. So that is fantastic. There's now this dedicated audio only button right here that when you press it, it brings up the audio menu on the screen right away without needing to, I mean, you can always map a, a shortcut function button, which is what I always did, but it's nice that they thought about that because you know, I bring that up all the time. As far as the cooling and that whole heating situation, I was able to run this camera with no heat issues in any situation in controlled indoor environments. It's winter outside, so it's even colder. But in room temperature under lights, there's nothing I could do to make this camera overheat. And there are controls for the fan if you need to, you know, crank it up a notch. As far as recording, you have two sort of mixed bay situation now. You've got a CF Express Type B and an SD card, you know, UHS-2 up to V90. For some because it's Panasonic, you should expect to have backup recording, relay recording, all that stuff to both cards, and you do, but it's limited to the codecs that you can use on SD. Anything that you can use on the SD, you can do dual recording between the CF and SD, but some things you can only do on the CF Express card. High frame rate all intra recordings, which are kind of expected, they go up to like 800 megabits per second. So even 48p and above, I believe, at all intra, is gonna be CF Express Type B only. And then any of the 5.7K all intras are gonna require the CF Express Type B because the all intra recording for the 5.7K is actually Apple ProRes. So you can record ProRes, it's only 5.7K, and you can do 422 or 422HQ, but all of those data rates are like a thousand megabits per second and higher. So whether it's 23.98 or 29.97 at the 5.7K all intra, it's gonna be ProRes when you choose that, and it's gonna be CF Express Type B. You can record 5.7K up to 60 frames per second, but you have to use H.265, and I believe you can do that to either CF Express Type B or SD card, and those could be then dual, backup, all that kind of stuff. So this camera's complicated when it comes to that kind of stuff. You know, I you probably just find a chart and read it, really. Uh, I do have a complaint though when it comes to longevity and that has to do with battery life. I was a little bit disappointed to be honest in the battery life of this camera. Maybe I'm, I'm not remembering well, but I thought I remember my GH5 and stuff of that like lasting quite a long time. And the full frame bodies, I was quite happy with as well. I think the first one where maybe I started to raise my eyebrow a little bit was maybe the S5, if I remember correctly. And this uses the same battery as the S5, 
which is that, you know, that new type uh, where it kind of looks a little bit like a GH5 battery, but it's new and it's called a DMW BLK22. Now, just like the S5, you can actually put uh, GH5 batteries in this camera. And when you do, some features turn off. The way that Panasonic explained it to me was, think of it that if you put a GH5 battery in here, it basically becomes a GH5. And if you put the new battery in, then it's a GH6, which is kind of interesting. So if you're shooting only 4K60 or whatever, and you're in a pinch, you can throw a GH5 battery in there. But if you want to shoot 5.7K, ProRes, all that stuff, you're going to need to put uh, a new battery in. But when you do that, I haven't been, in, I don't know, like a couple of my tests were pretty rigorous, but I only got like an hour and a half, sometimes an hour 20, sometimes an hour 40, hour 50, but I never got any of those ones where I was cruising two and a half hours, not once with this camera. And twice in my tests, I was in one of those situations where the battery was flashing red. and I was like, oh, we got to finish it. And I can't remember the last time I've been in that sort of situation where I was like, you know, concerned with battery life. Now, autofocus. This was, this was, I know I said early on, there's like the two major things I think with, with the GH cameras were autofocus and dynamic range. So we talked about dynamic range, let's talk about autofocus. Every time I do one of these things with Panasonic, they go, and we've improved the autofocus. This time, I like how they, in my, in my meeting, they weren't too, uh, they didn't spend a lot of time. They're like, look, you know, there's a much better processor in here, much better sensor, it's faster, it reads out crazy fast. In fact, the rolling shutter, if you're, I, I'm all over the place. I'm never like this where I mix I mix topics. The rolling shutter is not a problem. I, even if you're at 5.7K full, you know, the dynamic range boost on everything, you can you can slam the camera around in all different directions. You're not, you're gonna see barely anything warp. So rolling shutter is not a problem, but because it can read out so quickly, uh, they've also said that they, they've been able to use that to improve the autofocus. And I have noticed, as I usually notice with Panasonic, that the tracking, is always better every single time. By that I mean the, the ability for it to like find an eye, find a thing and track you throughout the frame. It does a great job of that. The problem though, which has always been the case with Panasonic is that just cause it tracks you doesn't mean that the autofocus looks good. And unfortunately it still looks bad in my opinion on the GH6. Now, just like with all of Panasonic cameras, there's always been shots that you can use it for that look good, you know? And, and if you've used these before, you know what those shots are. But if you're doing a shot where you're shooting somebody talking and you have any kind of speculars, you know, or like out of focus orbs, fairy lights, anything behind them, even even trees where like you can see like glints of light through the trees, you're gonna see those things pulse. And it still pulses, and yes, there's ways to reduce the pulsing, but you can never eliminate it completely. And people, including me, have made videos about it in the past of like how to reduce that stuff. I'm done with it now. I don't wanna figure out how to fix pulsing in a camera. So no, this is not autofocus for talking head. If you're gonna shoot YouTube videos and you wanna put it like you would put your Sony, where you just set it there, put on autofocus, you jump in the shot, this isn't what you want. It's it's not fixed in, in that regard, if that's what you're hoping for. It's still contrast, DFD, stabilization. This camera might be the best IBIS that there is. I mean like the same or better than Olympus now, because you still get that fantastic, I think, what do they got here? 7.5 stops of compensation. You know what, I can actually, I'll do a test for you right now. Okay, so here we go. I'm just aiming this at my Ada Mini below there and I'm at uh, 100 mil on the 35 to 100, so that's 200 mil full frame equivalent. And as you can see with the stabilization off, it's pretty shaky. I'm doing my best to hold it steady, but it's shaky every time I talk. Now I'm gonna flick the switch on the lens. You see that? It just like immediately locks it off like a tripod. And that's not even with the boost on. I can now press the boost IS mode if you really wanna turn yourself into a human tripod like that. And even with one hand, I can see my hand visibly shaking. And look, it like locks off the frame repeatedly. It has the most sort of like shocking IBIS factor when you do that on off test, but also it has a lot fewer of those weird wobbly warbly things. They said they spent a lot of time working on that. They already knew they had a good like locked off system. So now they wanted to make like follow shots, not do weird stuff. So I'll put a little follow shot on the screen now so you can see how that looks. But I, I'm really impressed. Oh yeah, and because of that IBIS, you can actually do the, you know, the high res photo mode where you take like multiple photos and stitch them together, get a higher resolution image. You can now do hundred megapixels high res mode handheld because of how good the IBIS is. Now, when it comes to price, make sure I give you the right numbers here. For Canadian and US, you're looking at $2,199 for the body only in the US, so 2,200 bucks and 2,900 bucks Canadian. And this is the part where, you know, we could probably make a whole video here talking about micro four thirds these days. I really have conflicted feelings on this camera. When it comes to Micro Four Thirds, it's the best Micro Four Thirds camera 
that there is, it, it, like easily, hands down. And the price isn't terrible, you know, 2,200 bucks. Yeah, okay, I could see that. But at the same time, there's this, you know, this whole micro four thirds versus full frame debate going on and everything. Is micro four thirds dead, all that stuff. And if we just stick just within Panasonic, obviously there's other cameras like the A7S III kind of solves a lot of stuff, but it's a different system, different lenses, different everything. If we just look at Panasonic and you're somebody who's not already all set up with your micro four thirds glass, because I think that's the perfect customer for this. But if you're somebody who's looking to get a new Panasonic system, the S5 is cheaper and the image is better. It doesn't record as fast, it doesn't have the same frame rates, the same resolution options, admittedly, and I think there's still even more record limits on the S5 that, that this, this has fewer record limits. So in terms of just doing more stuff, this camera does more stuff, it does, flat out. But the S5 image looks better. And I think that's what we're always gonna have to deal with with Micro Four Thirds, is that even when they go in and they put the dynamic range boost and they add, Im improving the noise profile and adding little, you know, algorithmic changes, it, yes, it looks better, I can see that. It's better than the GH5, but it is just automatically noticeably worse than the Panasonic full frame cameras. If you just want the best image you can get, then unfortunately, I'm gonna say it now, Micro Four Thirds is dead when it comes to the best possible image. But the GH6 is a great example of what Panasonic is able to do when it comes to just giving you full, like giving you just maximum features and functionality. And this camera is a testament to just how much Panasonic can stick in a body, because they stuck everything in here. The only thing they can't do is, you know, cheat physics, basically. They've done their best they can with dynamic range boost, but Micro Four Thirds is limited in that regard. So for me, I'm not going to buy this camera. I'm not interested in this camera in terms of my work. Micro Four Thirds is dead to me if this was the sort of the final flagship and I'm full frame only onward and upwards, but I could see this camera being useful to people who need all the features and functionality. And I, and I commend Panasonic for what they've put in here. And even one last little treat that I forgot to mention, we're gonna close on this. There's even a little pinhole thing on the bottom here. Can we get a shot of this? You see where you screw in your, your plate here? You see it's got another little hole there? That's so when you use one of those plates, you can put the little spring in there so it doesn't rotate on you. They thought of everything. They packed everything in here. Good job, Panasonic. All right. I'm done.